I'm Megan Joyce Tozer. I'm here interviewing Otis McGresham, who's the Assistant Director for Prevention at Vanderbilt University's Project Safe Center. I'm delighted to be talking with you today. Um, and the work that you're doing is so important at Vanderbilt University. And at SSAIS, we know that it also applies um, beyond the university setting even earlier to K through 12 education. Um, we are really interested in best practices when it comes to effective advocacy. And that's in terms of both supporting students when they've been harmed and the bigger and um, probably tougher problem of systems change on a mm -hmm. large scale. And I think you hit the nail on the head. There's, there's those two facets, right? There's helping somebody that we love and care about who's been harmed in some way. And then there's helping to change the system in which we all kind of interact with. Um, advocacy is not the same for both. So the, the biggest pointer, the biggest kind of, of, of piece of advice I can give you if you're trying to support somebody who's been harmed is to have a survivor-centered approach. We have to recognize that the person who experienced the harm is the one who's going to have to deal with whatever those ramifications are. So what they want to have happen is going to be the most important. It's not what you were taught to, to do is the right thing or what you would do if it happened to you or what you think should happen. It truly needs to be centered on their experience and what they're capable of doing at the moment, what they want to do at the moment, and kind of what processes or resources they, they feel connected to. So we, we put ourselves in a position to actually be helpful rather than harmful in that that supportive advocacy piece. Um, if we think about um, reporting to the police or reporting to a school administrator or kind of whatever that interaction or advocacy looks like, if the person who was harmed doesn't want that, then we've set ourselves up, even though we think we're doing a good thing, we've set ourselves up to, to harm them. So anytime we're working with somebody else's narrative, somebody else's story, we need to center our advocacy on what they want. When we start looking at bigger institutional systems, we start looking at bigger kind of cultural phenomenon, we need to advocate for the world that we want to see. Before somebody that I care about being impacted in a negative way, what system do I want them to exist in that will caretake for them, that will prevent that harm from happening, that will be responsive in a way that is, is supportive? At that point, we get to look at our moral center. We get to look at what we value, how we view the world, what our, our perspective on things are to shape what those systems should be. Most people don't think about the school environment as one that exacerbates harm. So how do I get you connected to the idea that the place where you're focused on test scores or you're focused on social emotional learning or you're focused on access to education or you're focused on food security, whatever the thing you care about, understand that's connection to violence and understand that connection to violence prevention. That's going to be the easiest way for you to, to do advocacy from that systems approach is linking it to what people already care about and know that most people are good. Most people don't want their institutions, don't want their communities, don't want their spaces to be ones that harbor harm. So how do we make that a reality? Systems, absolutely get, work for the ideal. Individuals, you got to work for that individual and what they need. I love the way you put that. And I also really appreciate you pointing out how even the concept of school as a place where harm can happen is foreign mm -hmm. to a lot of people. Um, could you speak a little bit to the problem itself for folks who don't really understand that sexual assault and harassment can happen as early as kindergarten? It does happen. It does happen a lot, uh, a lot more often than, than we want to, to think about. Um, and it's something that's completely preventable. We know that there are some developmentally appropriate ways in which, which children will understand their bodies, explore their bodies, figure out who they are. And if they're not doing that in an appropriate way where there's consent involved, where everybody's kind of aware and on the same developmental page, we've got inappropriate contact from children to children. So it could be kindergarten to kindergartner. It could be from administrator to child. It could be from older child to child. But that's not something that we always often think about. We don't think about the, the potential harm that happens there as students are developing relationships with each other and trying to figure out what does it look like for me to have meaningful relationships that aren't based upon proximity. Um, so some of those things happen naturally as people try to figure out who they are. And then sometimes we have perpetrators knowing that that's a vulnerable population that people aren't necessarily on the lookout for that will target those populations to inflict harm. How do we normalize the idea that if you see something problematic, you're not snitching, you're being a protective part of that community. Sometimes it's really just going to be about pushing back against some of those cultural narratives and providing a more positive narrative that's going to be less harmful, less impactful, and going to create a space where folks are going to be safe. Especially when we're talking about going from high school into college and the way that we 
um, treat and talk about all of these um, roles that children can play as they become adults and as they transition from K through 12 environments onto college campuses. So could you talk a little bit about that and about the, the gray areas and the issues in there? Yeah, and I, I think one of the one of the, the the seminal parts that even the work that I do at Vanderbilt is around how do we build a foundation of understanding so we're all talking the same language. So whether that is intentional conversations around relationships or bodily anatomy or interactions with folks or expectations of behavior, how do we say the same thing? So even at the college level, it's still having a whole lot of foundational conversations around here's what boundary setting looks like. Uh, and it's not just around romantic relationships. You get to set boundaries for any time your body does anything with anybody else. You get to determine what that limit is. So that's where we start. It's how do we get that foundation where everybody's on the same page? Um, and that's from like pre-K when we start talking about bodily autonomy. We start talking about um, one of the big things I remember when my kid was like, if you had a biter in the class or a hitter in the class, like we keep our hands to ourselves. We don't hit like. That's bodily autonomy. That's instilling some sense of responsibility for self-control, some sense of responsibility for what our body does and how we interact with others. Because it's not like that kindergartner who learned not to bite the person who was sitting next to them or not hit the person sitting next to them loses that memory or loses that life lesson. We just don't reinforce it as they get older. It's like all of a sudden in like second or third grade, when they're pulling somebody's hair or like pushing somebody on the playground, well, oh, that just means they like you. That's how you communicate that they like you. No, that is not acceptable anywhere else. Why would we make that acceptable in second grade? That's that's a memory that we're, we're putting and planting in there. So that's that counter narrative piece that I was talking about earlier. It's like, how do we create normal counter narratives where society may say one thing? And we're proving or providing to our children a narrative that says that's not okay and we do something different here um, rather than what we just kind of push aside to say, oh, that's that's kids are going to be kids or it's, it's a growing pain. They'll grow out of it. It's like, no, we have to help them grow out of it. Like we have to show them the right way. We have to give them kind of some direction. So if we can provide that counter narrative, provide that direction for folks as they develop and as they grow, I think that's going to be the most helpful. And when you're talking about, I mean, in addition to the counter narratives that we can provide as parents, as families, what can we do to make sure that schools are supporting us in that? Like, how can families be holding schools accountable? Um, one of the ways that as parents or as community members, as people who want their schools to do better, is to help your administrators understand how significant the experiences of sexual assault and sexual harassment are. So if we look at what, what are called adverse childhood experiences, so ACEs, um, there's lots of research on ACEs. Sexual assault and sexual harassment are one of those. So when we look at ACEs and we look at the impact to mental health, we look at the impact to mortality rates, we look at the impact to lifelong health implications, there's some significant research that suggests if we can nip these things in the bud and minimize the adverse childhood experiences that folks have, we can greatly improve people's lifetime, lifetime kind of experiences. Because as an administrator, you only have so many hours in the day. You only have so many metrics that you can you can work with. How do we put this on their radar to say, while you're working on your test scores, while you're working on your school improvement plans, while you're working on your IEPs, whatever that, that focus is, sexual harassment prevention ties into creating environments where people can learn. We just got to help our administrators see that. I wondered if you could speak, in addition to convincing administrators, which I see as kind of on one end of the spectrum of the work that needs to happen um, from mm -hmm. top down change, and also the work that students can do on their own, educating their peers um, and uh, founding a SASH club and using those resources if they don't feel like um, administrators at their school are necessarily on board. Yeah. Well, the beautiful thing about the SASH clubs and the work of, of Stop Sexual Assault in Schools is we've created a blueprint for folks to use. So the toolkits that are out there, the, the guiding principles of how to establish a club, of how to talk to administrators, how to look for advisors, all of that is in the SASH club website. You can start that club anywhere. So anywhere you have like-minded folks who say, this environment feels toxic, this environment feels harmful, this environment is not what I need it to be, if there's a sexual harassment or sexual assault kind of, of tinge to that feeling, SASH Club has a lot of resources that you can go on the website, click through the resources, look through and say, oh, 
here's how we can have a 30 minute conversation on XYZ topic that, that's really impacting my community. Students don't have to be experts. Students don't have to go to workshops. Students don't have to go get trained. They don't have to figure out any of that. The Science Club website has provided that for them. Um, so the resources that are there make it very easy to engage in those conversations. And by starting at the bottom, starting at the foundation, starting with the students who are experiencing the school environment, you're going to have people who are, are tied into the needs of that environment, the assets of that environment. So here's you know, the clicks that have already formed and what these clicks care about, what issues are, are really pressing, what issues aren't really pressing. Um, one of the things that I love about working with, with college students is I'm constantly being refreshed on language and lingo and how students connect to each other. Our students aren't dating anymore. So when we talk about dating violence and, and kind of how to prevent that, they're not dating, they're hooking up or they're talking to each other or they're cuffing or they've got a sneaky link or they've got somebody on their roster. Like there's lots of different ways that students talk about how they connect with each other. And if students are starting a SASH club, they know what that language is. So it's not worrying about somebody coming in to interpret and do a, an evaluation or an assessment of that community. They're a part of that community. So they can talk to their peers in a way that, that really resonates. As someone who is, is clearly parent age, the language that I grew up with is not the language they're using. So that's the power of the SASH club is if we can empower students and give them the tools, they can manifest it in a way that's really going to resonate with their peers. Um, and it gives them an opportunity to say, hey, administrators, here's a thing that we can tangibly do to address this issue that I've seen. So administrators aren't sitting there twiddling their thumbs trying to figure it out. It's, oh, all I have to do is support you in this. How do we make this a reality? I love that point that coming from within the environment and using the language is really important to connect with people and make it feel real versus just an outside presentation by someone who doesn't get it. I think um, change from within and demonstrating to administrators how much the students care and how much they need it. So when we think about if, if you start a club, any club, like you start a basket weaving club, like going through the process of initiating, this is what I'm passionate about. I'm going to find other people who are passionate about it. I'm going to set up a time. Like that's some leadership. Yeah. If we're starting a SASH club to address cultural issues that are going to create a safer environment for everybody else, that's leadership to a level of, I am, I am an activist at this point. So it's not just a hobby or an interest that I have. It's me leading other people to a better version of the world than currently exists. And that's something that goes on college resumes and, and applications. That's something that really goes into the core of who people are. It's like, I get to live out my values. I get to say, I want to leave the world a better place. And that's who I am at my core. And this is how I get to do it. Um, there's, there's energy there. There's, there's development there. There's growth there. If I leave XYZ high school and I graduate and I'm gone, yeah, I may have set some academic records. I may have set some athletic records. But if I leave a sash club, that's really going to change in the culture and keep that culture safe. That's a legacy that I get to leave that says I was a part of that. And it's hopeful for all of us, too, to think that we have this new generation of leaders who have experience and who understand the depth of the issue coming out mm -hmm. of high school age. Otis, it's been so fun talking to you and I've learned so much. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.